Today we talk about some issues which are still controversial after 500 years of debate, namely communal property, enclosure, and the state. I want to begin with a claim from James Scott from his excellent book, Seeing Like a State. Scott argues that what we think about as private property was actually a creation of governments. In particular, that individual fee simple ownership, the idea of property where one person owns a piece of land and can exclude others, that this was a creation of governments who were looking to simplify or to make legible property rights in order that they could better tax, conscript, and control people under their jurisdiction. I think Scott is partially right. Not completely right, but partially right. And in order to better understand this, we need to better understand historically what has been the alternative to private property, which has not been government control, but village or communal property. So let's look at communal property. Here from the previous slide is the classic example of private property. Notice that it is fenced, and there's no hunting, no fishing, no trapping, no trespassing for any purpose. It's strictly forbidden. Violators will be prosecuted. Notice that this is also posted. It's written down. It's legible. The opposite of all this is communal or village property. And here the key concept is usufruct rights, which are rights of non-owners to use, enjoy, or profit from aspects of property. And here Scott gives a nice stylized example. Quote, let us imagine a community in which families have usufruct rights to parcels of cropland during the main growing season. Only certain crops, however, may be planted, and every seven years the usufruct land is redistributed among resident families according to each family's size and its number of able-bodied adults. After the harvest of the main season crop, all cropland reverts to common land where any family may glean, graze their fowl and livestock, and even plant quickly maturing dry season crops. Rights to graze fowl and livestock are extended to all local families, but the number of animals that can be grazed is restricted according to family size. Families not using their grazing rights can give them to other villagers, but not to outsiders. Everyone has the right to gather firewood for normal family needs, and the village blacksmith and baker are given larger allotments. Trees that have been planted and any fruit that they may bear are the property of the family who planted them, no matter where they are now growing. Fruit fallen from such trees, however, is the property of anyone who gathers it. When a family fells one of its trees, or a tree is felled by a storm, the trunk belongs to the family, the branches to the immediate neighbors, and the tops, the leaves and twigs, to any poor villager who carries them off." End quote. Now this is a stylized example that may represent no particular village, but it's very reminiscent of English village life before the enclosure system. This type of system would also be well understood even up to recent times by villagers in India and parts of Asia and in Africa. Notice how complex the system is. Everyone has some rights to some things. This may be very good for insurance purposes it may be not so good for efficiency purposes, as we'll talk about in a moment. Moreover, this system is highly historic. It's based on memory and convention. It's not written down. And because of that, it's not really capable of being understood by outsiders who don't have access to the historical knowledge and conventions. Scott's point is that when land is divided communally in the way I've just described, it's hard to tax people, hard to know how much they can afford. It's hard to find people, to identify them. It's hard to control people. Rulers would much rather have land divided like this, because in this case, you know how much people can afford. You know where to find people, because people can't leave without leaving their land, their livelihood. You can identify people. You know where their homes are, so you can conscript them and so forth. And Scott is right that rulers, uh, kings and monarchs and colonial governments, such as the Japanese colonial government in Taiwan and in Korea, they often established or tried to establish land which was divided in this way. Where I disagree with Scott is in thinking that this was the only reason towards the evolution of fee simple private property in the modern sense. Because in fact, there's a lot of other problems with communal property. It's difficult, for example, to take advantages of economies of scale. Who is going to buy the mass combine thresher when he doesn't own the entire piece of land? 
There's little incentive to make major capital investments, for example, in irrigation, when the land is owned communally. There's potentially overexploitation. This is the tragedy of the commons. This problem, the tragedy of the commons, was limited when you could limit communal life to villages. But in a modern society where people are moving about, the tragedy of the commons becomes a real problem. There's also little scope for entrepreneurship and experimentation when to change anything, you have to get mass agreements among everyone who may have a, a right, a usufruct right to parts of the land. So it becomes hard to shift resources into higher valued uses. You get gridlock. You don't get experimentation and entrepreneurship when every single villager has the right to block new ideas and new ways of doing things. So there are also efficiency reasons for the evolution from communal property to modern private ownership. The basic idea here is that when resources are more valuable under one property rights regime than under another, incentives are going to exist for a transfer. However, we have to be forthright. The transfer process is often ugly. The enclosure movement in England, France, and elsewhere, for example, in which the common lands were fenced off, this movement at times was ugly. Not always. There were compensations made. A majority of people often had to agree in order to fence in the land. Lots of land was fenced in voluntarily. Nevertheless, it is true that during the enclosure movement, common, traditional, long-standing usufruct rights were often abridged. And we see this debate and we see this evolution being echoed in developing countries today. It's often not a pretty process. There are increases in productivity when you shift to new property rights regimes, but also changes in the distribution of wealth. And sometimes it's hard to disentangle. And here we have to also be forthright in that there is still a big debate over the enclosure movement in England and France and elsewhere about how much was efficiency gain and how much was distribution. In my view, there was substantial efficiency gain. I come to that view from thinking about how this process evolved, not just in England and France, but it has come across all over the world. We see the same movement all over the world to fee simple property. And I think that suggests that there's an efficiency reason. This is not to deny, however, that there was also redistribution, often to the powerful. Lots of other further readings on this topic. You can look at uh, James C. Scott on the state's role in creating private property. On the enclosure movement debate, uh, Donald McCloskey and Robert Allen take opposing positions on the efficiency of that uh, movement. Uh, Jean-Laurent Rosenthal looks at the French case. Uh, Chi Ming Ka looks at uh, the Japanese case in Taiwan. That's also looked at, as well as uh, Korean and other, other examples, by uh, Dong Wu Yu and uh, Richard Steckel. Lots of debate. Thanks.